Shabbat Shalom, Israel. Uh, today's class, uh, first of all, giving all praises to the Most High and His Son, Yahweh Shai. Um, but today's class is, is Christ, is Christ real? And is the New Testament uh, the actual, you know, New Testament? Are we in the new covenant? Right? Are we in the new covenant? So that's the question today. Because I was talking to a brother. Okay. And he. Uh, I was talking to the brother in the comments today. And one of the brothers that I was talking to. And I always talk to this brother. Uh, he pretty much always, we, we've done a lot of uh, talks before on live. And uh, the thing is, uh, last time we talked, we talked about this, uh, the fishermen, the fisher, the fishers of men, right? We talked about how uh, Christ is going to make you a fisher of men right christ is going to make you a fisher of men christ is going to be uh you know you're going to become christ's disciple right and you're going to be a fisher of men right and so um the brother was having a hard time dealing with the fishers of men right he he was thinking about the the way that he was thinking about fishers of men he was thinking about it in a way like, you know, when you read in the scripture in Matthew where the brothers are, you know, they, they uh, when they said fishers of men in, in Matthew, I'm going to get the scripture, right? Where it says the brothers was like fishing or whatever. They had their rods. <clears throat> they had their rods out, fishers of men, and they were fishing uh, something like that. And that, that was in the New Testament, right? We was reading about that in Matthew. Um, and I want to bring that scripture out real quick. I think that's Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. We're going to grab that real quick. Um, because the brother was saying that... Uh, he was pretty much saying that... Uh, when he read this scripture, when he read this scripture, I'm going to read it to you real quick. It said in it's Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter four, verse 18. All right. So we're going to read it. Well, let's read, let's read chapter, let's start at chapter, I mean, verse 16, Matthew chapter four and verse 16. Let's start right there real quick. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16. Let's start there. Alright, so Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16 says, The people which sat in darkness saw great a great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Alright? So a lot of brothers and sisters that were sitting in darkness got out of darkness. They saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So some people was sitting in the shadow of death for a long time, generations after generations. But the light has sprung up in these brothers and sisters, right? Throughout generations of time, right? There's always been generations of time where people were in darkness and the light shined in the darkness and they sprung up out of the darkness. And then, you know, some brothers and sisters didn't shine, didn't shine and didn't get out of that darkness, right? It's always a remnant. <clears throat> Verse 17, it says, From that time, Christ began to preach and to say, this is what he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? 
Christ began to preach. Who is this Christ character? Because look, everybody wants to know who is Christ. Is he real? Right? Is the New Testament a fraud? Or is this thing real? Right? And I was reading through it and uh, today. And I um, just went into uh, Genesis. Went back through Genesis and read up on Noah and the flood. So I was reading up on Noah and the flood. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I went into Abraham after that, right? Because after Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you get Abraham, right? So we should read that. But before we read that, we should read verse 18 real quick. And Christ, Yahweh Shah, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, right? So this is what I was dealing with with this brother, right? We was talking about the fishers of men, right? And I was talking about it in a way of being a fisher of men, in a way of teaching people the true doctrine of Christ. And this brother was te uh, speaking on this fishers of men in a way of talking about these brothers are literally, you know, see, you, you're before Christ came on the scene, you're, you're, you were you were actually fishing for real, like you were actually in the water fishing, and had a pole, you had a rod, and you had a swing, you know, and the net and everything, and you were li literally just sitting there in the water fishing, and I was like, how is that possible? How is it, you know? Uh, how are you getting that uh, that understanding, you know, how are you getting that understanding from this Bible, you know? And um, so, uh, you know, because I was getting one interpretation and he was getting a whole different interpretation of this same scripture right here. Matthew chapter 4, and verse 18. Let's read it again. It says, And Yahweh shall walking by the sea of Galilee, right, saw two brethren, so was he actually walking by a sea? Right? That's a big question. Was this an actual sea of Galilee? Was, was these brothers in by a body of water? Or is the sea the nation of Israel? Right? So some people are going to say the sea is a body of water. And some people are going to say that the sea is a, a, the nation of Israel. You see what I'm saying? So one person is carnally minded. And the other person is spiritually minded, right? So let's read this verse 18. It says, In Christ, Yahweh Shai, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. So if they casting a net into the sea, right? If they're casting a net into the sea, is this talking about them casting a net into the actual sea, into the actual body of water? Or are they casting a net into the nation of Israel, casting a net into the, uh, are they actually casting an actual net, right? And this is the argument that the, me and the brother was having, is we was going back and forth on what is the sea and what is this net, Okay. Because if they're saying casting a net into the sea, so was Christ walking around looking for brothers that was fishing, looking for, and, and, and with a net, an actual net in the sea, into and casting nets into the seas, was that is that the goal of Christ? Was that the immediate goal of Christ? Was to you know, let's say you was walking around and you was Christ and you was saw two brothers named Andrew and Simon, and you saw them casting a net into the sea. We're talking about Christ here, right? A brother that is a high priest. We're talking about a, a high priest, right? We're talking about a holy man, the righteousness, the righteousness of peace, right? The, 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 the righteousness of the righteousness, okay? So if this man, Christ, was, Yahweh Shah was, you know, really... Is, is, what, what's his mission here? Right? What is the purpose of Christ? Is Christ looking for people that is fishing? Right? Is Christ looking for brothers and sisters that are going fishing? Or is Christ looking for brothers and sisters to bring you into the truth of God? And to, or, or, or bring you into keeping the commandments of God? Right? So which one is Christ trying to do? Is Christ more concerned with you fishing? 
Is Christ more concerned with you casting a net into the, the, the sea? Or is Christ more concerned with you going out there and casting a net unto the actual brothers and sisters? Right? That sea. You see what I'm saying? The, the nation of Israel. Right? Because that sea needs that sea needs more attention than the fishes in the water. So which sea are you more concerned with? As if you are Christ-like, right? Which sea would you be more concerned with? Would you be more concerned with the sea of the brothers and sisters that you cast in the net to, to help them, like I'm doing right now on this live, right? Casting a net to you, right? To the sea, right? To the nation of Israel. Or would you be more concerned with me casting a net to a fish and eating fish? Which one would you be more concerned with as a Christ-like person, as a disciple, as an Israelite, right? Which one would you be more concerned with? Would you be more concerned with the fish or would you be more concerned with the people, the brothers and sisters that are in, that are that are needing you to cast a net to them to get them to be, bid it to the marriage, right? So which one would you which one would you uh cast a seat cast a net to? People or fish? Right? So Matthew chapter four and verse eighteen clearly is not talking about an actual seat. Because if you are in the spirit of Christ or if you are Christ like then you would look at this scripture a little differently. You would look at it with a bigger purpose, right? You wouldn't look at it with a undermining uh, purpose, right? A lesser purpose than the serving uh, uh, the service of God, right? Because the service of God is to get people into the truth. The service of God is not to get people to go fishing into the water. You see what I'm saying? So if you're looking at this as casting a net into the sea, as in going fishing, then you're pretty much saying that God, you're pretty much making God of none effect. Because you're pretty much saying that in this scripture, casting a net into the sea. If Christ was coming up to these two brothers and, and, and he's looking at these two brothers casting actual nets into seas, picking up fish, uh, bass and tacos, and crabs and shrimps and lobsters, then you have pretty much made God of none offense. You, you follow what I'm saying? So you, if I was reading the scripture as a Christ-like brother, I, you know, that's really in the spirit, I would look at the scripture more so as this casting a net into the sea is more talking about discipleship. You see what I'm saying? It's more talking about discipleship. It's more talking about casting a net into the brothers and bringing them into the spirit of Christ and bringing them into, you know, the commandments of God. Right. The right, which is the law of Moses, which is the law of Christ. So if you was a Christ like person, would you be concerned with people fishing in the water and catching tapos and fish and bass and red catfish? And. You know, tilapia? Or would you be more concerned with brothers and sisters that are fishing to catch brothers and sisters, to catch people, to catch Israelites, and bid them back to the marriage? Put a put a one in the comments or put put a put put which one would you would do? Would you catch fish? Right? Would you catch fish? Or would you catch put a put it put it in the comments? Right? And we're reading uh Matthew chapter four and verse uh eighteen. I want you guys to go to that scripture and tell me which one you think this casting a net into the sea is talking about. Right? So I want you to tell me which casting, which one is this? Is this which one would you do if you was Christ? Would you want would you want to see your brothers casting a net into the sea and fishing for fish? Or would you want to walk up to your brothers and see them casting a net to their brothers and sisters? Right? And, and helping them uh, bid them back to the marriage. Which one would you want to do? Which one would you? Which brothers? Which brothers would you want to uh, to be walking up to here? In Matthew chapter four and verse eighteen. Put it. Put it in the comments. Put it in the comments. 
Which brother would you want uh, to, to to walk up to here as a Christ? If you was Christ, Matthew chapter four and verse eighteen. Matthew chapter four and verse eighteen. Which which go to Matthew chapter four and verse eighteen. KJV. Read that. We're talking about in uh, Yahusha walking by the sea. Right? We're talking about this sea. Is this a real sea or is this talking about a different sea? Is this talking about the sea like the Atlantic Ocean or is this talking about the sea like the nation of Israel sea? Right? Like a lot of bodies of people. Bodies of people, not bodies of Israelites. Or is this talking, is this talking about the bodies of Israelites or is this talking about bodies of uh, large bodies of water? Right? That's the big question. Right? Because we're going into answering the big question of exactly. Right, 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 right. So one is carnally minded and one is spiritually minded. Okay? One, one, um, and one interpretation is carnally minded and one interpretation is spiritually minded. So both interpretations work. Both interpretations make sense. But one is spiritually minded and one is carnally minded. Okay, so put it in the comments. Which one would you do, right? If you was Christ in Matthew chapter four verse eighteen, and it says he was walking by the sea, quote unquote, of Galilee, he saw two brethren, Simon and Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, right? For they were fishers. Is this literal? Is this literal? Is this literal? Are they really? Out there right now casting a net into the sea. Are they actually really doing this right now? Are they actually got a fishing rod and they're cashing nets into the sea and catching lobster, shrimp, you know, all that, right? Lobster, shrimp, crabs, uh, you know, uh, fish, different fish, bass, you know, tilapia. Are they doing that? Or are they doing, are they looking, are they looking for fish like, Brothers and sisters, like you are fish, right? Aren't you a fish, right? Put it in the comments. Put it in the comments. Are you a fish or are, are you looking for actual fish, right? Couldn't you be a fish in this scenario? See, that's the problem. See, that's the big question. A lot of brothers and sisters, they don't look at this as them being the fish. You see what I'm saying? I'm a fish. You a fish. We all a fish. You see what I'm saying? So the problem what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is that it's a parable. It is a it's a dark saying. You follow what I'm saying? It's a it's a it's a concept, right? It's a metaphor, right? It's a like an allegory. You see what I'm saying? It's like a um it's like a dark saying. You see what I'm saying? Because are you can you be a fish? Can somebody cast a net into the waters to catch you? Right? Because look, am I not on this live right now casting a net to you? Are you the fish? Can, can I be John and Peter right now? John and Simon? Simon and Peter? Can I, and Andrew? Can I, be, can I be Andrew and Simon right now? Right? Can you be Andrew and Simon right now? Right? And what would you be doing if you was Andrew and Simon right now in this scripture? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. What would you be doing? Answer the question. It, this is a free-for-all. You guys can literally come in on this thing, man. Feel free. Answer the question. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. We're reading Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. So I'm asking you, can you be a fish? Are is it talking about a literal fish, like a catfish or a tilapia? Or is it talking about you being the fish, like an Israelite fish? You see what I'm saying? So when it says sea, can a large body of water, can Israelites be in the sea? Can they be in a large body of water? And you go and you throw a rod out there and you catch them? You see what I'm saying? And then what, what happens? They, they begin, you reel them in, right? That's what you're supposed to be doing as an Israelite. You see what I'm saying? That is your whole mission as this, and the truth. 
Your whole mission is, is to be a, fi a fisherman. Your whole, mi your whole mission is to be a fisher of men. All right? And we're going to get a precept on that. So, is, so the scripture in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 is not talking about an actual, uh, an actual, right, a fisher of men, a fisher of souls. So in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, it's not talking about an actual fish. You see what I'm saying? See, that's carnally minded. That's what Christ is dealing with here. Christ was dealing with the Pharisees about this, this same question. Because when they was reading the word of God, a lot of brothers and sisters would think that the fishers, the fish, were actual fish. They would think that it's a catfish or a, uh, at a, as a, a tilapia. And then they got picked up by Christ. All of a sudden they got reeled in by Christ. And then Christ told them to drop their fishing rolls and come follow me. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of brothers think like this. Can you believe that? A lot of brothers and sisters actually think like this. A lot of brothers and sisters will read the scripture and they'll go, man, they was literally fishing in, in, for catfish. And then Christ came on the scene, walking on the Sea of Galilee and told them to, uh, you know, drop your fishing poles and come follow me. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? People actually think like that. Put carnally minded in the comments so that way you can, uh, so that way I know you guys are paying attention. Put carnally minded in the, in the comments that way, because that's a carnally minded person. If you think like that, right? If you think like that, you're very carnally minded. Because the whole purpose of Christ is to get you to think spiritually minded. All right? To, to get you to understand precepts. To get you to understand concepts. To get you to understand metaphors and allegories and dark sayings. You see what I'm saying? So that's how you're supposed to be. You're, you're an Israelite. You're supposed to be thinking spiritually. That's the problem that we had all the way during the time of Moses and Noah and all those brothers. Because what happened was you had a lot of brothers and sisters that wasn't thinking spiritually minded. Just because they were keeping the law of Moses doesn't mean that they were thinking spiritually minded. Right? A lot of brothers right now today are still thinking carnally minded in the truth. Right? I, like I said, again, I just talked to a brother. I talked to a brother online. I had him come on live with me. And we talked about this very scripture, Matthew chapter four and verse 18. Right. And he literally told me that this scripture was uh, 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 was about Simon and Peter. The, and, and they were literally fishing with the rod of fi uh, rod and they were fishing in the Atlantic Ocean and they were catching fish. And Christ told them to follow, uh, drop your fishing poles and follow me. Right. So I've had people I've had people literally. You know, like I said, I had a brother that was carnally minded. I had a brother that was talking to me and he told me this, that this was, that's literal. That scripture is literal. You see what I'm saying? It's, it, it's figuratively, it's literal. Then so, so we, 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 you know, we agree to disagree and we, 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 you know, we still, we still follow each other on Instagram. We still follow each other on Snap and all this um, but again, that brother has his issue, right? That he's dealing with. And, you know, like I say, we both have two different opinions and two different point of views, right? One point of view, God is accepting of, and one point of view, God is denying it. God is completely denying that point of view. Okay. So you got to understand, you have to get spiritually minded because one, that corner mindedness is dead. Right. We can pull scriptures on that and, uh, you know, we can go into that all day long. But this is going to probably be a long class because we're talking about is Christ real? If Christ wasn't real, then why was he telling everybody to be spiritually minded? Why was he telling everybody to be to walk in the spirit? You see what I'm saying? To be spiritually minded, which I just gave you an example of just now. I just gave you an example of that. Right. I just gave you an example of how Christ wants you to be spiritually minded. Right. Because when you read Matthew chapter four and verse 18, when it's talking about Simon and Peter. Right. It's talking about it's not talking about casting a net into the actual sea. Right. It's not literally it's not literal. You see what I'm saying? And so the problem is, is you got a lot of brothers that think that this is literal. 
And so that's why Christ came on the scene. You see what I'm saying? Because back then, before Christ, everybody was being carnally minded. Right? They would look at this scripture and think that it was literal. Casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. So a lot of brothers are literally thinking that, hey, we're going to be out, you know, in the in the pool, in the in the in the in the uh in the pond, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna cast the net into the into the pond and we're gonna cat we're gonna we're gonna catch some lobster and some and some fish, man, with some some tal tilapia and stuff, right? See what I'm saying? So you got two types of Israelites. Okay? You got one Israelite that is cornerly minded. And then you have another Israelite that is spiritually minded. Okay? And that's why Christ had to come on the scene to cut that veil off these brothers' eyes. Because you got a lot of brothers and sisters that are, they have a veil over their eyes. Man. You see, they got a veil. They got a veil over their eyes. You can talk to them all day long, but it, they, it's not going to ever register. You see what I'm saying? It's not going to ever register to these brothers. Because the thing is, is that they still got that veil today. Same thing they had with Moses. Right? They had that veil, man. It's, they, they had that fleshly, stony heart. You see what I'm saying? So they very stubborn. They very stiff-necked. And even today, they still the same way. You see what I'm saying? So the thing is, is that that's just the bottom line, man. You got brothers that are going to be fleshly-minded. And then you got brothers and sisters that are going to be spiritually minded. And that's just the bottom line of this thing, man. So the goal is to get everybody in a spiritually mind, in a spiritual mindset. So here's the problem. Here's the problem with a lot of these camps. Because here's the thing. And a lot of some of these individual lights. The problem is, is that in what we just got to talk about, right? Being carnally minded and spiritually minded. The goal is to be spiritually minded. Here's the problem, though. You got a lot of brothers in a lot of camps that... Can you get him quiet, please? Can you get him quiet, please? Let him get him quiet, please. You got a lot of brothers that... Uh, a lot of brothers and sisters right now that... Well, I'm just going to say elders because, look, here's the thing. I don't really deal with the congregations of the camps, right? I'm not really... I'm more focused on the prophets. I'm more focused on the elders, which that's how you should be, right? Because the brothers and sisters that's in the congregation, they don't really know what's going on in these congregations, right? Spiritually. You see what I'm saying? So we dealing with the, the, the top people. We dealing with the elders and stuff. We're not dealing with these, you know, the people that come into the congregation. We're not dealing with that. So a lot of times when I'm talking about this stuff, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the congregation, the brothers that's coming into the church. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the elders, right? The leaders of Israel, the ones that are representing us in Israel, the top people. You understand what I'm saying? That's, those are the people I'm dealing with. Those are the people that I focus on, right? So going back to Christ. Christ wants us to be spiritually minded, right? You got brothers out here that literally think that fishing in the water with a pole and catching tadpoles. And then you got brothers that think fishing in the and fishing in the sea means fishing in the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel is the fish. You see what I'm saying? So there's two types of fish. You got the fish Israelites, and then you have the fish, the actual fish, like the tapos and the in the in the in the catfish and the you know in the in all of them, the lobster and everybody else, right? So you got two types of Israelites. One gonna think like that, and then another gonna think the other way. You see what I'm saying? So these camps, a lot of these camps are cornerly minded. They think that this scripture right here, Matthew chapter 18 and verse uh, chapter four and verse 18 is literally talking about an actual pole fishing. You know what I'm saying? And, and an actual fish. You see what I'm saying? An actual like catfish. You know what I'm saying? J Jesus Christ came on the scene and just said, OK, cool. Yeah, uh, let's let's go ahead and, uh, you know, take drop your fishing poles. Stop fishing for catfish and follow me. So you got Israelites like that. You have camp leaders like this. You understand what I'm saying? You have elders like this. You have noble men like this. You have famous men in the congregation that you probably listen to every day that think like this. <laughs> Man. So this is why Christ is needed. You follow what I'm saying? 
This is why Christ is needed because you got brothers that are elders and leaders in the congregation of Israel that are literally leading the, the, the sheep astray because they're keeping them carnally minded. They're keeping a veil over their eyes. They making them think that fishers of men is actual like fish, like going and fishing, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean. You see what I'm saying? We don't need that no more. We don't need brothers and sisters like that no more. We need brothers and sisters that are going to teach these people, the church body, to what? To come into the actual spiritual mindset of Christ, right? To understand that fish is talking about Israelites. That To understand that fish is talking about you. So put a one in the comments if you understand that, man. If you understand what I'm saying. Uh, you know, put fish in the comments. Fish is you. The fish is you, right? So that was a little lengthy, but I just kind of wanted to give you an understanding and the difference between carnally minded Israelites and spiritually minded Israelites, okay? So I just wanted to kind of give you those differences. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, In Yahweh, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, right? For they were fishers. So Andrew and his brother Simon were fishers, okay? So are this talk, is, are, were they fishers of fish or were they fishers of men, right? Fishers of Israelites. So if you spiritually minded, you should be thinking fishers of men, <laughs> Right? Hopefully, you're spiritually minded and you're thinking fishers of men. Now, if you're thinking fishers of fish, then we're going to have to deal with that. And then, obviously, we're going to be here for three hours. I don't have time to deal with that. You see what I'm saying? That's the problem. I'm trying to, I'm trying to deal with the elect. I'm trying to deal with the brothers that are actually in the spirit of Christ. You see what I'm saying? The ones that's receiving the real message of God. Not the carnal message of God, but the spiritual message of God. Right. So I don't really have time to sit here and be your counselor. I don't sit. I don't have time to sit here and be your 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 psychologist. You see what I'm saying? OK, you might have some mental issues. I'm just saying, I mean, hey, you might be a little autistic. I mean, hey, you know, a lot of these vaccines, we got he got hit with a lot of these vaccines when we were <laughs> kids. And a lot of these vaccines that made a lot of people autistic around this place, man. So, I mean, hey, might be autistic. You know, you might be, hey, I'm just telling you the truth. You know, a lot of brothers and sisters might have some diseases up on them, man, you know. So, hey, that's a lot of times why a lot of brothers can't receive the word because they done got caught up in all of this, you know, all of this crazy stuff that's going on in the world. Fishers of men to bring salvation. Exactly. Fishers of men. So we're looking for fishers of men and women, man. We, we are fishers of men and women to bring men and women to what? To Christ. The true Christ. Because the brothers that's following after the fish, the ones, the actual tilapia, those brothers, those brothers are actually not really looking for the true Christ. You see what I'm saying? They looking for the, the fake Christ. You see what I'm saying? It's two Christ. One carnal and one spiritual. You see what I'm saying? So you got to be looking for the spiritual Christ, not the carnal Christ. Because a lot of these camps, they following the carnal Christ. So which Christ are you following? Put it in the comments. Are you following the spiritual Christ? The one that's talking about fishers of men, Israelites? Or are you the one following the fishers of fish, the actual tilapia and catfish? Right? So put it in the comments. Which fish are you following here? Because that's going to determine which type of person you are and what most high dealing with you, how he dealing with you. See, the problem is that these brothers out here and these sisters out here think that they don't, they think that we don't know how they're getting dealt, how God is be, dealt, dealing with them. They think, I'm going to say this again. They think that we don't know how God is dealing with them in the spirit. We know how God is dealing with you in the spirit. And the problem is that they'll come to you and think that you don't know what they really did, what, what problems that they have, and what, what issues that they have in their heart. That's, what your job. That's our job as Israelites. So you coming to me thinking that I'm not a priest, thinking that I'm not a, 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 you know, somebody that can see within, 
that cannot see you got to understand that who you talking to a lot of brothers and sisters don't know who they're talking to they don't know who they're listening to and talking to you don't know who you're really dealing with you see what i'm saying a lot of even some brothers there's a lot so you gotta that's why god said understand all men man always you know uh uh uh, uh give an answer to every man and ask you of a reason of hope with meekness and fear but a lot of people, man, what they do, the first thing they do is they just discredit you. The first thing they do is they shame you. The first thing they do is they murder you. The first thing they do is they mock you. The first thing they do is they reproach you. The first thing they do is afflict you. The first thing they do is personate your character, right? You got to understand that when you're dealing with people, man, you got to be talking to everybody. You got to talk to, you got to talk to this person and you got to talk to that person. See, I talk to everybody. There is no respect to persons we got. So if you in the spirit of Christ, there is no, no respect to persons. I talk to everybody. You see what I'm saying? So if you're walking in the spirit, I'm going to know. Because I'm walking in the spirit. So if I'm not walking in the spirit, I can't tell you how to walk in the spirit. You see what I'm saying? So you got to understand that when I'm dealing with brothers and sisters, I already know who's in the spirit and who's not. And they don't even have to open their mouth. I already know. I'm just like... <laughs> Bro, you're not in the spirit. They don't know that, though. They talking to me like, oh, you know. They don't even know. I'm looking at them and I'm like, bro, you are not in the spirit. Right? A lot of people don't know who they talking to. I already know you before you speak. And the crazy part is, man, a lot of brothers and sisters come to me and they be thinking that I don't know who, who they are or what they come from or whatever, whatever. And I'm just like, bro, I already know you. <laughs> Because your spirit bears witness. Right? I already know who you are. Just like I know who Christ was on the scene. Just like how John knew who Christ was. See, how did John know who Christ was? Right? See, people don't ask that question. How did John know during that time who Christ was? Just as much as John knew who Christ was, is the same way John probably knew who the Pharisees was too. Mm. See, you, you think he just knew who Christ was. But you don't realize that he knew also who the Pharisees were too. See what I'm saying? See, that's wisdom, right? So just like John, I know, get this one. Just like John, I know who Christ is today. And just like John, I know who the Pharisees are today. Why is that so hard to understand? If John did this, and Christ said, and John said, he that mighty to me, uh, whose shoes I can, I'm not worthy to run loose. He, if John knew this, and, and he said, what? If Christ is within you, you should be doing the same thing, right? Is that not why Christ died for you? Right? So, what is the problem with that? Why can't people understand this? Why can't people understand that they're supposed to be in the Christ-like spirit? Why don't they understand that they're supposed to be like Christ? That Christ is within you. Why? Why do people not understand this? Why do they come to you and think that you're just a nigga? Why do they come to you and think that you're just some nigga in the truth? That you don't know what you're talking about. You see what I'm saying? Even camps do this. They come to you. They don't even pick up the phone. You call them. They don't even pick up the phone. Right? So everybody not your brother. Everybody not, everybody not uh, dealing with you like, a, like Christ. Like, like in a Christ-like way. You see what I'm saying? Just because they call themselves Israelites don't mean that they're going to deal with you without respect to persons and without that dissemination, man. So a lot of times what happens, man, well, it says a friend never meet and miss, right? Because they're going to always meet the way God intended. You see what I'm saying? They're going to always meet the way God intended. But if you're not meeting a miss, if you're not meeting the way God intended, then you're meeting the wrong way. So is Christ real? Right? And that's this whole that's the whole question. That's the whole message of this thing. Because I was just talking to that same brother that was telling me that the fishes of men were fishes like tapos and catfish. That same brother said that we're not in the new covenant. Right? So I'm going to deal with that question today. I'm going to deal with that question.
because a lot of brothers will pull Jeremiah 31 and 31. And let's get that real quick. Let's go and get Jeremiah 31 and 31. Jeremiah 31 and 31. They're going to pull it and they're going to say that we're no longer, we're not in the New Testament. He ain't came yet. That's not happening right now, right? We're, we're, we haven't received the spirit of Christ. We haven't received a new spirit. Christ is full of phony and we haven't received a new spirit. That's all bull crap. You understand what I'm saying? So are we in the New Testament right now? Are we in the new covenant right now? Are we in the new spirit today? Or am I just fluffing? Am I just, I don't know. Let's see. Let's find out. Let's read Jeremiah 31 and 31. Because this brother likes to pull the scripture. So let's go ahead and read it. Jeremiah 31 it says, Behold, the days come, said Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Right? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. They broke this covenant. Although I was an husband unto them, they broke it, said the Most High. But this was shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. Right? Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the most high for they shall all know me from the east from the least of them unto the greatest of them said Yahweh for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more Woo. key word here it says that and they shall teach no more every man and every woman his neighbor key 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 word Key, keep that in mind. So back then we used to teach every man and every woman their neighbor to know the Lord, to keep the commandments of Moses, right? And if you didn't, you got put under the penalty of death, treason, okay? So with that being said, okay, when Christ comes into you, when the spirit of Christ comes into you, you are no longer having to teach every man his neighbor to know the most high because they're going to know the most high through the spirit because God is going to teach them. Yahweh, Yahweh Shah is going to teach them the laws, right? Because he's going to put it in their heart. See, the problem with carnality is that a lot of times with carnality, man, is that, you know, you forget a lot of times with carnality. Because carnality is temporary, right? Carnality is fleshly, right? And you know with the flesh, man, you know, one minute you might feel one way, the next minute you might feel another way. You see what I'm saying? When it comes to the flesh. But, you know, when it comes to the spirit, the spirit is forever. The spirit is everlasting. The spirit of God is forever, man. The things that are in heaven are forever, man. Infinity and beyond, right? So the same way it is in heaven is the same way it is on earth, right? So the problem is, is that, you know, a lot of brothers and sisters, man, they don't focus on the things in heaven. And that's why they carnally minded, because they focus on the temporary things of, of the things that's in the world, right? The things that are of the flesh, right? The law of Moses. That is also something that is of the flesh. Yes, it is a law that we shall keep. But it is of the flesh. You sin, you get put to death. That is flesh. Okay? We need a new, we need something new here. Because, you know, see, the problem is that the law of Moses was fault. It, it was fault. It had a lot of faults in it, right? It had a lot of breaches. You see what I'm saying? Because people can get away with it. People can get away with their sins. You see what I'm saying? People can literally break the law of Moses and you wouldn't know nothing about it. Because you wasn't dealing with God, you was dealing with man. So when you're dealing with God, you know, God see everything. You see what I'm saying? So the law, the law of Moses or the law of Christ in your mind and in your heart, you can't break that because you're breaking the covenant through God. Not through Moses, but through God. See, so when you break that, you're breaking it completely at God. God is taking complete control here. 
Right? So you got to understand that the law, of, the law of Christ, the law of Christ is greater than the law of Moses. Because it's something that you can't see. The law of Christ is something that you cannot see and it's forever. But the law of Moses is something that you can see and it's temporary, right? And it's, and it's, 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 it's constantly unsatiable because what happens? We always want to satisfy our flesh. The flesh can never not be more satisfied. It always wants more and more and more and more and more, right? So we have to learn how to be satisfied in the spirit. You see what I'm saying? So let's get, you know, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, right? Let's get that. Let's get chapter 7 and verse 1, right? It says, for this, Meshachedet, the king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And I thought this was kind of curious because when I read this, verse 1 here about Meshachedet, I had went over to the Old Testament and I read it and I said, who is this Meshachedet guy, right? Who is this guy, right? Because... Um, you know, Abraham met him in the beginning. If you read book of Genesis, you read Genesis and you saw where Abraham met, um, you know, Melchizedek, right? He met Melchizedek in the, in the, uh, in the land of Canaan or whatever, over, over by, uh, uh, Abram, okay? Somewhere in there. So he met, Ms., uh, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, uh, was like a high priest, right? Which was interpreted as the priest of Peace, the high priest of peace, the righteousness of peace. So this guy was the righteousness of peace, right? That Abraham had met, right? So let's get the uh, the scripture on that as well, right? In Genesis, where uh, Abraham met Melchizedek, all right? In uh, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. This is in Genesis. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Okay. And he blessed the, be the most high God, with which he had delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Right. And he gave him tithes of all. So Moses, I mean, uh, Abraham gave Mesizedek, Tenth, a tenth of the uh, of his of a portion of everything that he had to Melchizedek, because that's what you do with all the high priests. You're supposed to give a uh, tenth of a portion of your your uh, your your you know your wealth to uh, to the high priest, right? So that's the that's how you that's the same thing that you do with uh, with Christ. You're supposed to give a tenth of yourself to Christ. You see what I'm saying? And a lot of people not even doing that. Right? They're not giving a tenth of themselves to Christ. You see what I'm saying? So it says then, chapter uh, 4 and verse 1, it says then Christ, uh, Yahweh Shah, led up the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the, temp and the tempter came to him, he said, If do be a son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Right? But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Man, man so you're supposed to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, man. Then the devil taking him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Man. So, and sat him, sat un, said unto him, if do be the son of God, cast down, cast thyself down. But it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up. Lest any time do dash thy feet against the stone. Right? And Christ said unto him, it is written again, thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Man. So Christ, man, is really, he going in. And again, the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and glory of them. And said unto him, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me, man. Then Christ, Yahweh said unto him, get thee hence, Satan, 
right? For it is written, do shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall do serve. And then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him, right? And now when Christ had heard that John cast into the prison, he departed in Galilee, right? Leaving Nazareth, he came down into Capernaum, which in the uh, up, uh, the up the which is the uh, the sea coast in the borders of uh, Zabulon and Nephtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, "The land of Zabulon, the land of Nephtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles." Right, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in the shadow of the dead light is sprung up. Right, so. If you in darkness, you going to spring up, right? You going to see, you, you know, you, you should be trying to see a great light. And to them that sat in the region in shadow of the dead, light is sprung up. From that time, Yahweh Shah began to preach and to say, right? See, preaching is how you get out of the light. So everything, that's how you get out of this darkness. Is you have to be, you know, somebody has to preach to you. Right? Somebody that's in the spirit of Christ. And say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Yahweh shot walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon and Peter and Andrew, and his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Right? So, you know, they were fishers of men. They were fishers, man. They were also fishers of men like Christ. Okay? And he said unto them, Christ, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, man. And they straightway left their nets and followed him, man, right? So that's what you're supposed to be doing, right? You're supposed to be following Christ. You're supposed to be following him, man. You know, you're supposed to be casting that net unto the people, man, unto the people of Israel and following them, man, right? So but let's, get, uh, let's get back to Genesis, uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. I mean, verse 2, it says, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being interpreted, interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So Mechizedek is the king of the peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginnings of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. So, Melchizedek is a priest without a father, without a mother, without a descent, having neither the beginning of days nor the end of life. But made like unto the Son of God, abiding a priest continually. Hmm. The king of peace. So, Melchizedek, who is this guy? Melchizedek, right? The king of peace. Is this Christ? Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoil. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take the tithe of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he who descend is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And her, here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may say, so, I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, prayed tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Mesedek met him, right? And it says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, right? So we received the law under the Levitical priesthood, right? What further need was there that another priest should rise again after the order of Mesedek and not be called after the order of Aaron, right? So what was the need for another priest, right? If there, the perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. For under it, we did receive the law under the, under the Levitical priesthood. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Mesedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Right? Not be called after the, the order of Moses. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a, of a necessity a change also 
of the law, right? So, because if we change priesthoods, we changing the the law. You see what I'm saying? We changing the law, kind of, right? So we going from a fleshly law to a more spiritual law. If we change in the law to Christ for he whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. And then it says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. So Christ sprung out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Because Moses was a, uh, I want to say Moses was a Levite. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Messiah, that there arises another priest. And it is yet more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. Because Melchizedek gave the order of Levitical priesthood to Abraham, right? He was the one that met Abraham in Genesis, right? We just read that. And gave uh, Abraham the, uh, pre the Levitical priesthood. Okay, he pretty much gave Abraham the Levitical priesthood because how was it all? How was it passed down all the way to Moses? Right? How was it passed down to to Moses? Somebody had to give it to Moses. See what I'm saying? So you got to understand this is a whole order of things here, like a chain of command. <clears throat> so if they're for the perfection by the Levitical priesthood. For under it, the people received the law. For what further need was there that another priesthood should arise after the order of Mel Mel Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Moses? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of a necessity change also of the law. For whom, for he whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of when Jesus death, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. See, and we just got through talking about that, man. See, who is made? This order, this, this, this priest who was made was not made after the law of a carnal commandment because the law of Moses was a carnal commandment, right? It was a fleshly commandment, right? But after the power of an endless life, Christ was the new priest after the order of a endless life, after the order of the spirit. For he testified, right? Who are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, right? So everybody's after the order of Melchizedek anyway, right? Starting with the law of Moses, but Christ was the next, see, the next things to come, the hope of things to come. You see what I'm saying? For there is verily a disannul, a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness of and unprofitableness thereof. See, the weakness of the commandment of Moses, it, it was very, sometimes, it was a lot of times, it was very unprofitable. You see what I'm saying? For the law made nothing perfect. So the law made nothing perfect. The law of Moses made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. So bringing in of a better hope uh, did make things perfect, right? Always hoping for something new. Uh after the the order of Moses, right? Everybody was hoping for something new, right? Because the law was kind of faulty. By the which we draw nigh unto God, right? So we, how do we draw nigh unto God? We draw nigh unto God by hope, by faith. Because without hope and without faith, we can't really necessarily Please, God, because look, you can be doing all the works of Moses 
and still not please God. You can still not please God by the law of Moses because all the works that you do under the law of Moses can be fleshly. You see what I'm saying? And that's what happened with Cain and Abel because a lot of times, you know, Abel would give his offering and it pleased God. And Cain would give his offering and it didn't please God. You see what I'm saying? Because why? Cain was not living out the law of Moses through faith. And that's why I didn't please God. See, it pleased God that Abel was keeping the law of Moses through faith because he was keeping it through faith, right? But Cain and Saul wasn't really keeping the law of Moses through faith, through the faith of Christ, through the spirit of Christ. They was keeping it through uh, they were just keeping it through the carnal commandment of Moses. That was it, right? So their sacrifices meant nothing to the most high because it was just, it didn't have no hope attached to it. It didn't have no faith attached to it. You see what I'm saying? So Abel and David, they were the only ones during that time that kept the law of the spirit because they had faith and they was keeping the law. So the, so the main thing here is hope and faith. That's what pleases God the most is your faith and your hope in God. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, right? Bringing in of faith did make something better because it actually pleased God to do this. Because hope, what is hope? What is faith? Faith is something that is not seen. And that's what God wants to see, that you're doing something that is not seen, the, the integrity part of God, right? That's, the, that's more important than the physical acts of God. By the which we draw nigh unto God, right? Verse 19, that's how we're going to draw nigh unto God. Through the hope of God, through the faith of God is how we draw closer to God. How we draw, how we get a better understanding of God and how we, how we increase our faith and how we have a relationship with God. The most. See, because Abraham, even by faith, he was a faithful servant, even by his faith, right? Before he even received the law. So you have to understand that faith is more important than the law. And as much as not without an oath, he was made priest. So Christ was made priest as not without an oath, right? Christ was made priest without an oath. He was made priest for those priests were made without an oath. But this was an oath that by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Do are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek anyway. Right? So by so much was Christ, Yahweh Shah made a surety of a better testament. Because he fulfilled the New Testament. He fulfilled the, the testament of Moses. Right? The faith of Christ fulfilled the testament of Moses. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Right? And they truly were many priests, right? Because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, right? Because look, all the other priests was not going to, they didn't want to suffer on the cross. They didn't want to suffer themselves. They didn't want to redeem. They didn't want to redeem Israel and make a sacrifice. They didn't want to. They didn't want to spill their blood on the tabernacle, right, for the sins of Israel. You see what I'm saying? And so they truly were many priests, right? Many priests, many high priests throughout all of Israel that were high priests every year that would come and do. Uh, the feast and do all of the, 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 the rituals and stuff, right? For the Israelites, sins, offerings and all this stuff, trespass offerings, burnt offerings, different things like that. So every year this was going on, right? Usually during the time of the Passover. 
But all these priests, after year after year, centuries after centuries, millennials after millennials, right? All these priests were not willing to suffer to continue by reason of death. They didn't want to sacrifice themselves. Right? For you. Right? They wanted you to put that turtle dove up. You give me that turtle dove, and then, you know, you sacrifice that turtle dove. But I'm not sacrificing myself for you. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of priests, this, you know, in the flesh, the brothers and sisters that's on living on earth, them priests, the high priests, the Levites, they didn't want to suffer to continue by reason of death. But this man, Christ, this man, because he continued, continued ever, had an unchangeable priesthood. See, Christ had an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seeing he ever lived to make intercession for them. See, he was the only one that made intercession for Israel. Wherefore, he is also, he able also to save them, the Israelites, to the to uttermost that come unto God by him. So if you come unto God through the spirit, through hope and faith, only if you come unto God through hope and faith, come unto the spirit of Christ through hope and the faith, right? Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for the Israelites, right? For them, for such an high priest became us. That's Christ, right? So Christ became the brother, uh, Christ became the con, con, con. Christ became the high priest for Israel, who is holy. Christ is holy. Harmless. Christ is harmless. Undefiled. Because a lot of these high priests were not. Separate from sinners. See, Christ was the only one that was separate from these sinners, man. And made higher than the heavens. Christ was the only one that was made higher than the heavens. Who needed not daily, as though high priest, to offer up sacrifice. Christ was the only one that didn't need daily to offer, offer up sacrifices. See what I'm saying? For, first, for his own sins. Christ was the only one that needed not daily, as the, uh, those other high priests, during the time of Moses, to offer up a sacrifice every year for his own sins. Christ was blameless, man. Blameless. He didn't have to offer up a sacrifice at all because he didn't have no sins. He was perfect unto God. No sins, blameless. Blot the, the, the blameless sheep, the blameless goat, right? No spots. And then for the peoples, for this he did once when he offered up himself. Christ offered up himself, the perfect lamb of God offered, offered himself because he was the only one without a blemish. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. Right? Let's look up this word infirmity. The law made, uh, you know, the high priest which have infirmity. This is infirmity. But I would like, so let's look at this. Let's look at the definition of infirmity real quick. Let's let's look at that real quick. Definition of infirmity. Uh physical or mental weakness. See, so basically what it's saying is for the law make it men high priests which have weaknesses. But Christ didn't have no weaknesses. But the word of the oath which was since the law. Christ was the word of the oath from the beginning before the law. Man. Christ was the word. He was the word before the law ever became into effect. He was the hope of Israel all along. He was always the hope of God. The faith of God before the law of Moses. For the law maketh me and high priests which have infirmity. See, it make the law make these men high priests. Right? But the word of the oath, Christ, which was since the law, before the law, 
Make it the sun. See, just make it the sun. The word of the oak make it the sun. But the law make it the high priest of Israel. You see what I'm saying? But the, the word make it the high priest of the spirit. Right? So if you want to be a son, if you want to be a son of God, perfect, a son of God, balanced, clear, then you have to have, you have to receive the word of oat, the word of the oat of God, the faith of God, the hope of God. You have to receive that first because that was before the law. You see what I'm saying? That's what makes you a son of God. Who is consecrated forevermore? God, Yahweh Shai is consecrated forevermore. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So this is the total of everything that we're saying here. This is the total, okay? The aggregate total. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Christ has been sitting on the throne on the right hand of God in the majesties in heavens before the law of Moses. After the order of the Melchizedek, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which is the Lord pitched and not man. So the true tabernacle, which Lord God with which the Most High Yahweh had pitched before he pitched the law of Moses. He was the minister of sanctuary in the true tabernacle. Christ was the true tabernacle, which the Lord, the Most High Yah, pitched before man. Before he even pitched it to man, he pitched it to Christ, the Spirit. Man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. You see what I'm saying? Christ had a gift to offer, a sacrifice to offer unto you, right? For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. So... If he was on earth, then he shall not be a priest because there was already priests on the earth, right? That offer gifts according to the law all the time. The priests always offering gifts according to the law. They used to offer gifts according to the law when you made your sacrifices and different things like that. They would offer gifts and different things like that unto you, right? Temporary gifts. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, said he, that do make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. See, Moses knew that God was making all things according to the pattern that was showed to thee in the mount, the mountains, you know, right? So who served the example in the shadow of the heavenly things? So Moses was the shadow of the heavenly things. He was the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was a monist of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, man. So Moses was the was about to make the tabernacle. But you got to understand, Abraham made a tabernacle too, physically, before Moses. Right? And a lot of people forget that. Abraham made a tabernacle. No, Abraham made an ark. And then so Moses made the tabernacle. Moses made a tabernacle, a physical tabernacle, but Christ is the true spiritual tabernacle. Okay? So Christ was before Moses. And a lot of people think Christ was after Moses. That's where, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I just realized it. Christ is before Moses. Christ is before Moses. Christ is not after Moses. That's what everybody is going off. Christ is before Moses. Christ is not after Moses anyway. Christ is the true tabernacle. Christ was always before Moses. 
not after Moses. For if he were on the earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Who serve under the example in the shadow of heavenly things. Right? But now he uh, now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. See, if Moses' tabernacle, the physical tabernacle, was faultless, then we wouldn't have had to make a new tabernacle unto God, right? Because it wasn't faultless. It was faultful. It was a lot of things going on with it. A lot of error. A lot of debt. Right? So if it was faultless, if it was blameless, we wouldn't be here today. If the mom of Moses was perfect, we wouldn't have been here today. So it, it's not perfect. The law of Moses was not perfect. Because if it was perfect, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be in this situation that we're in right now. Then shed no place have been sought for the second. Exactly. No place would be fought. We wouldn't be looking for a second tabernacle. Because Moses' tabernacle would have worked perfectly. We would have been fine. Everybody would have been happy. We all would have been getting along. Everybody would have been in unity. And yon, yada, 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 right? But that's not the case. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So this brother told me that there, this is not the, he said, the covenant hasn't came yet. Right? But this is in the New Testament. And he just said right here that this is a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So is not Christ the new covenant? So you got brothers and sisters out here right now saying that Christ is not the new covenant. But after what we just got through going through and what we just got through reading, Christ is the new covenant, the new tabernacle, the, the true tabernacle, the spiritual tabernacle, the second covenant. Right? So, right? So the Most High said, behold, the days come, said the Most High, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant, the first covenant, the law of Moses, which was faultless, faultful, right? Which had a lot of error. And I regarded them not. You see, the Most High regarded you not because you, you destroyed that tabernacle, the first tabernacle, said Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. After what days? After the days of Moses, said the Most High. I will put my laws into their mine and write it in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying Yahweh for uh, no no Yahweh right for all shall know me right from the least of them to the greatest of them is that not happening today are we not from the least of them into the greatest of them starting to come into this new spirit because we didn't need, we didn't have a tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle today to get us back into the to the law of Moses? Right? There is no Levitical priesthood anymore, right? Because look, where is the Levites? Right? Are we keeping all of the Passovers and the and all of that stuff perfectly? No. Even today, we're still not keeping that perfectly. We don't have the Levites. We don't have lamb. We don't have two turtle doves. We don't have two lambs and sheep and goats. So how did we come into the spirit? How did we, how did we get awakened again? Right? How did we get awakened again? Right? If we were still keeping the physical tabernacle. You see what I'm saying? The, the, the tabernacle of Moses. How did we get awoke, awoke again? How did we get awakened again? You see what I'm saying? For if, right? So it says, and they shall not teach it. So it says, and for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. So this is how we became back into the truth. Because why? Because most high God was merciful to your unrighteousness. He was merciful 
to your unrighteousness, to your sins. He was merciful. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So obviously he didn't repeat. He, he hasn't. He's not remembering our sins anymore. He's not remembering our iniquities anymore. He's not remembering your unrighteousness anymore. He's not remembering all of the things that you've done wrong and all the things that your father's done wrong over the 500 years anymore. Right? Because if he was, we wouldn't be in the truth. We wouldn't be awake right now. We wouldn't be keeping the law, statute, and commandments again. Right? We wouldn't be thinking about the law, statute, and commandments again. Right? So he, 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 he was merciful today, 2022. He was merciful today. He was, he, he did give us that grace today. Right? He forgot all about your sins, man. But why did he forget about your sins? Why? Why did he forget about your sins? Let's keep reading. It says in that he said a new covenant. He had made the first old. So that's why he made a new covenant, man. But how did he make this new covenant? He had to make this new covenant with somebody. Somebody had to make an atonement for you because obviously he had some mercy on you. So he didn't just have his mercy without a sacrifice. Because if you understand the Levitical priesthood, you got to understand that there had to have been an atonement that took place in heaven. Somewhere, physically or in heaven. And we know it wasn't physically because we don't have a physical tabernacle right now. Today, we don't have a physical tabernacle today. There is no tabernacle. It got destroyed in 67 B.C. Under the under uh, General Pompey. Right? So the tabernacle is gone. So how did how did we get back into the spirit of Christ? How did we get back into the to the thing, man? Right? So Christ, Christ is the reason why we got back into this thing. Because there is no Levite, no Levites, there is no Levitical priesthood. So in that he said a new covenant he had made the first old. So that one was waxing old, man. That one had went out. The new covenant is here now. Now, that which is decaying and waxing old is ready to vanish away. So the old covenant is done away with, man. We are in the new covenant. And anybody that tells you otherwise is a Pharisee. If anybody else tells you otherwise that we are not in the new covenant and that we haven't came into the new covenant, then that brother is and that sister is deceiving themselves. And they probably not reading their Bible. And they probably don't know how to read their Bible. They probably don't have an understanding of their Bible. Right? So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. Right? Exactly. A physical sanctuary. Right? And we just talked about that. For there was a tabernacle made. Right? The first, wherein was the candlestick. You see, the tabernacle had a candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary, right? Now, that was the worldly sanctuary. That was the worldly tabernacle. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So, the second veil is the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which the second veil had the golden censer. In the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, right? In Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant, right? Meaning the, the tables of the covenant, which was pretty much the law of Moses, right? The tables of the covenant. Because you remember the two tablets that Moses had, the Tantian and Commandment. So that's, that was the... That was the veil. That was the higher tabernacle, right? Because you had the second veil. You had the first veil which was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which was the first sanctuary, right? And then you had another sanctuary where it went even further. This was the highest sanctuary, the high priest sanctuary, right? Where this was the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, right? Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and shoe bread and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant, which is the law of Moses, which is the top ten commandments, written engraved in images and stone. 
Verse 5, it says, And over it the cherubims of, the, of, of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak particularly. And over this second veil, and the, it, 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 over it, the cherubims. Oh, wow. These are like, cherubims are kind of like if you, cherubims, let's look and see what cherubims are real quick. Let's see what a cherubim is. That is pretty much, uh, a cherubim is pretty much like an angel, right? Cherubim, like a cherub, a winged angelic being described in a biblical tradition as intending on a god. It is represented in ancient Middle Eastern art as a lion or a bull with eagles and a human face and regarded in traditional Christian antiology as the angel of second highest order of the, uh, the second highest order of the ninefold celestial hierarchy. Man, so the cherub is the highest, the highest of the highest veil. A representation of a cherub in art depicted as a ch chubby, healthy looking child with wings. A beautiful or innocent looking child or something like that, right? So that's another term for it. But baby, infant, toddler, pretty child, lovable child, behaved child. So man, that tells you right there, the cherubim is the most behaved child. So sometimes that that's the ones that's going to make it to this high, this second high priest level. You have to be a very behaved, innocent child, a very pure, dear, lovable child, a babe in the arms of, and right? And Christ talks about this all the time, right? You got to be child. You have to have a childlike mindset in order to enter into this second veil, right? In order to get into this narrow path. You see what I'm saying? So in over it, verse five, right? We're looking at chapter nine, Hebrews chapter nine, verse five. It says in over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly, right? They can't speak particularly on this cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot now speak particularly. Man, they can't even speak on this particularly right now. They couldn't even speak on it. Verse 6. Now, when these things was were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So that's the service of God right there, right? Because remember, most high said he gave us the service of God, the the, the promises, right? The the judgments and the, all these different things, right? Well, this is the part of the service of God. Not the promise of God, but the service of God. Chapter 7. But into the second went the high priest. See, so the second veil was the high priest, right? The high priest went into this one, man, right? So the priest went into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, right? That's us, right? We the prophets of God. We accomplish the service of God, right? We're the first priest, right? Then you have a second priest, which is the high priest, along once every year. So the second priest only comes back, comes through every year. But the, but the first priest is the one that, he does this every day. He's, he's working every day. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. We just got to read that. So the, uh, the, the, the first priest uh, is the one. That's us, right? We, the, we, we do the service of God, right? We the ones that go every day, go out there and teach the people. But then you have the second priest, which is the high priest. That's the one that goes every year, not without blood. They, they supposed to be spotless, blameless. The second priest is like the elder that the bishop, the second priest, which offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So the second priest is the sacrificial priest. He's the one that offers up, you know, the errors for all the, 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 the first priest, right? All the errors of the Israelites and the, 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 the second, the, the first uh, priest, the prophets and the prophetesses, right? The children of Israel. So you have a second priest, which is the, uh, the main son of God, right? It's only one of them. But it's many of the, the first priests. You see what I'm saying? Kind of like us, right? It's a bunch of Israelites, but then you still have a high priest. If you go into like a camp, you know what I'm saying? You're going to have a high priest, and then you're going to have your captains and everything. And then you're going to have your noblemen and stuff on the side. But you got that one high priest, and that's the one that is uh, the one that's supposed to be really offering himself as a sacrifice every year without spot, without sin, without transgressions to the Most High which he offered for himself, right? For in for the errors of the people. The Holy Spirit dissignifying that 
the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. So it was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So the first priest didn't do the, the, the service. They didn't do the service of God perfectly. The first priest, right? Which stood only in meats and drinks, right? See, the first priest stood in a lot of meats and drinks, milk and different things like that, right? Meats and milk, right? And diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation, right? So they did a lot of diverse washings and, you know, did a lot of preaching of meats, uh, drinks, and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, which is, you're talking about the law of Moses, which is all of those 613 commandments imposed on them until the time of reform, to the time of re reformation, man. So they did this all the way up from Moses till now, till, till Christ. But Christ being, being come in a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Christ's tabernacle was not made with hands. And that's the problem. A lot of people are not understanding that Christ's tabernacle was not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. So not of the, the, the physical building, man. Right? Not of the corner world. You see what I'm saying? Neither by the blood of goats and cows, man. Neither by the blood of goats and cows. But by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Right? So he, he, he obtained eternal, eternal redemption for the Israelites. Right? For if the blood of the bulls and the goats and of the ashes of a heifer, which is like another, like a, animal, sprinkling the unclean, sprinkling of the blood, right, of the animal, the uh, heifer, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. So for if, if the blood of the bulls and the goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, right, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, right, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, right? So how much more is Christ, right? How much more is Christ? If, if, if we were sacrificing back then under the physical tabernacle with Moses, right? And those were our purification days and our consecration days and our circumcision days. How much more is the circumcision of Christ? Because he did, he offered himself uh, his blood as well, right? without spot, right? So he is the lamb. Christ is the lamb of God, the spiritual lamb of God, right? <clears throat> and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. So what are you talking about? A lot of brothers out here talking about that he's not the mediator of the New Testament. So if you have the spirit of Christ, you are in the New Testament, you are in the new tabernacle, in the spiritual tabernacle. You are under the spiritual tabernacle today. If, quote unquote, if you are in the spirit of Christ, you are in the New Testament. You're still in the Old Testament under the law of Moses, under the law of sin and death. And you're not supposed to be under that testament anymore because we are now in the New Testament. So all these brothers out here that's still in that Old Testament, man, shoo! I feel sorry for you, buddy. If you don't think that the New Testament is already here, if you don't think the new spirit that the Most High said he was going to put on us in Jeremiah 31 is here, then you're not the one. Hopefully you come in, man. Hopefully you get in, man. But right now, man, if you're not receiving this, what I'm preaching right now to you, then most likely you did not, you're not, you're not in the new kingdom right now, man. Right? You're still in the old kingdom and you're going to be done away with. 
Because that's old and it's about to be washed away. God is going to wash that away. So everybody that's in that, to to get washed away, man. For where is a testament is, there must also of a necessity be the death of the testator. See, the death of the testator. Who was the death of the testator under the law of Moses? The Levites. They died. Where are the Levites today? Nowhere to be found. So right now, the death of the Old Testament is done away with because that was done away with under the 67 B.C. Uh, the general Pompeii when they destroyed the tabernacle, the Levitical priesthood. During that time in 67 B.C. when they destroyed that time, when Rome merged with Judea, that was over with. Moses' testament was over with. Moses' tabernacle was over with. So if you're still under the physical fleshly tabernacle of Moses today, keeping the law of Moses today under the physical fleshly tabernacle today, you are still under the law of sin and death and you are going to the lake of fire. Okay. I'm telling you, man. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter nine and verse 15. That by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So the but you ain't received internal inheritance. You haven't received internal inheritance if you have not received the promise of Christ. If you have not received the the Lamb of God, the, the Son of God, Christ, the Spirit. That was that shed his blood in heaven, in the heavenly tabernacle for you, for remissions of sins. You are still under the old covenant. And if you're still under the old covenant, that covenant has been done away with completely. Completely done away with. We are now under the New Testament and the law is within your heart. We. The law is within your heart and in your mind. The law is no longer in your flesh. It is in your heart now. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, which were which all call are called, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of a necessity be the death of the testator, which we just showed you that Leviticus, the Levitical priesthood. The testator, the Levites, are dead. So they already dead, man. So that testament is done. You see what I'm saying? That testament is done. The Old Testament is done away with, bro. There must also of the necessity be the death of the testator. So Christ died, but Christ is eternal because Christ died in heaven. Christ was risen again. He came down in the flesh and was risen again in the spirit. And he's an everlasting testator. You see what I'm saying? So Christ can never be defeated. But see, all these brothers, the brothers, the, the Levites and all them, they can be defeated. So if you're still under the law of Moses, man, you're going to the lake of fire, man. That's just bottom line. For there is the testament is, there must also be a necessity, be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Man, so the testator has to die in order for the testament is a force after men are dead. So the testament is only made a force or is made of a, 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 a is activated, right? It's only activated if uh, the testator is dead, right? Okay, so the testator has to be dead in order for that in order for it to be activated. But it's saying for a testament is a force after men are dead dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator is alive. Okay, so it's saying, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. 
So the rep, the first testament, the, the Old Testament was dedicated without blood. You see what I'm saying? Because nobody, nobody died for the first testament. No, no high priest died for you for the first testament for your sins. Because remember, we said what? In the Old Testament, the father couldn't bear the iniquities of the son and the son couldn't bear the iniquities of the father. You see what I'm saying? So during the Old Testament, you couldn't bear the iniquities of the father or the son. You see what I'm saying? Up on the Old Testament, up on the law of Moses, you could not bear the iniquity of the son and you couldn't bear the iniquity of the father. Right? So there was no testator for the Old Testament. Right? There was no, uh, well, it was, but it was animals. You see what I'm saying? Which the tabernacle is destroyed. So the animals are no longer able to be sacrificed for to be a testator for you. Right? So you got to understand that now, since the tabernacle is destroyed and you can't use animals to be a testator for you, somebody has to be a testator for you, right? In order for your testament to be complete, in order for your agreement or your covenant with God to be complete, somebody has to die. Somebody has to die for you to be under a new testament or under a testament period a covenant period somebody has to make a sacrifice for you in order for you to be under any type of testament you understand what i'm saying whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood for when moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of cows and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. You have to kill somebody. Somebody has to get sacrificed. It was therefore necess necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So there's better sacrifices in heaven for you, right? There's better sacrifices in heaven that you can sacrifice than the ones that's on the earth. Because goats and cows and stuff, man, that's, it's imperfect. You see what I'm saying? You get tired of taking, going and finding a goat and killing it and putting it on the tabernacle and doing all that and shedding blood and all that. You get tired of doing that, right? So you have a better sacrifice now. Christ. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear into the presence of God for us, right? Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. See, he don't even have to enter every year, man, right? Nor yet that he should offer himself often, right? So God, uh, Yahweh Shah don't even have to offer himself Often to like, you know, a lot of these uh, priests, they have to offer themselves every year. But Christ don't even have to offer himself every year, man. He did it one time and that was it. Sacrificed himself one time for you and that was it. You don't have to offer your sacrifices every year like the high priest did, the physical tabernacle. Christ did it one time and that is it and that is all. Because that's an eternal sacrifice, right? For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, right? Because you got to understand, Esau was the beginning of the world, right? And Jacob is the, is the is, uh, I mean, ja uh, Esau is the end of the world. And Jacob is the beginning that follow it, okay? So, Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. <clears throat> so if you look for Christ, if you look for Yahweh Shai, then he will appear with he he, he he you know he'll appear unto you. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 it says, For the law have a, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the corners therefore thereunto perfect. 
Right. You can't make the sacrifices, those carnal sacrifices perfect if you was keeping the Levitical priesthood. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscious of sins, right? Right, so if you were doing this anyway, if you was doing the, the Levitical priesthood, then, you know, uh, it's saying that uh, shouldn't you have no more conscious, feel no no consciousness or no guilt? You not you don't feel convicted or anything after you purge your sins with goats and lambs and turtle doves, right? So the worshipers, the Israelites that worshiped uh, God once purged themselves with these sacrifices should have had no more conscious of sins, right? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. <laughs> There was always a remembrance of sins made every year, even after those sacrifices, right? For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins, right? So it's saying that it is not possible for the blood of goats and wool and, and, and all this stuff and bulls and goats to take away these sins. Wherefore, when he coming into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering do what is not, but a body has to prepare for me, right? And a burnt offerings and sacrifices... For sin, do has n had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will of o the will, O God. So above when he says sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, do what is not. Neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God, and take away the first that he may establish the second. So Christ came in and he said, you know what, I'm going to take away the first so that way he can establish, so God can establish the second tabernacle by which he, uh, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. <clears throat> and every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So in every priest standing daily. So the, my, my question is this. Um, <clears throat> how, even if you go back into the law of Moses, where are the Levites? How are you going to, how are you going to uh, keep the physical tabernacle? With, how are you going to keep the physical tabernacle without a high priest and without Levites? You see what I'm saying? So... You got to have some type of uh, Levitical priesthood. And right now, there is no Levites. And every priest standing daily ministering and off offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And henceforth, expecting till his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. So by one offering, he didn't have to do many offerings. He only did one offering, one sacrifice, and he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that, we, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Most High. I will put my laws into their heart and in their mind, and I will beat right them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remissions of these is, there is no more offering of sin for sin. Right? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Christ, Yahushua, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. So the veil was Christ this whole time. The veil was Yahweh Shah. That that was the veil Moses had on his uh on his on his heart. You see what I'm saying? Moses had that veil up up until uh he died, pretty much, right? And that veil was on uh a lot of these brothers, these Israelites, uh as well. The veil, the veil of Christ. You see what I'm saying? your flesh, that stony heart. Just because you was keeping the law of Moses, you still had that veil on your heart. You still had that veil over your eyes, that veil over your ears, that veil over your mouth. 
that veil over your, over your, you know. So, and having an high priest over the house of God. Right? Let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that's how we, it says, let us near, draw near with a true heart and assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil uh, conscience, right? From an, uh, heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth of God, the knowledge of the truth of Christ, there remain no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fearful indignation will show devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who had trodden under the foot of the Son of God, right? If you trespass the Son of God, how much more will you be, <laughs> uh, uh, how much more will you be put to death, right? And had counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified and purified an unholy thing, and had done despite the spirit of grace, Unto the spirit of grace. Right. So for it, we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. Right. I will recompense, said Yahweh. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, man. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, man. But call to repentance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. Partly while ye were made a Gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Right? Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which had great recompense of, re of, of, of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So once you do the service of God, you are going to receive the promise of God. But you have to do the service of Christ now, right? We used to do the service of God by keeping the law of Moses and different things like that and making sacrifices under the Levitical priesthood. And um, every year and all that stuff to the high priest. But... Now we have to do the service of God that way, but we also have to do it, the service of God through the spirit of Christ, right? Through faith, through hope, through love, through the goodness of God, through the mercies of God. That's the other tabernacle. That's the higher tabernacle. You see what I'm saying? That's the higher services of God by giving alms, right? By, by, by giving alms, by, uh, by loving your brother like yourself, right? Like by, by, by doing the higher level of vibrational things, the positive things of God, right? Doing the higher vibrational things of God, right? But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. So we are not of them that draw back into perdition and to sin, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul, right? So if you fall out of this truth, Pretty much, you drew back into the sins, man. You drew back into your sins. You drew back into... This is talking about the law of Christ. This is even more complicated because you can draw back into your sins under Christ. And that is very, very, very deadly. Um, so, you got... Man, you because you basically a high priest. So, pretty much, the next generation of people, the next Israelites of people are going to be high priests. 
All of them. Every single last one of them are going to be high priests. Every single last one of them are going to be high priests. There's not going to be not one slacking. You see what I'm saying? So this is going to be a very, very, very even harder walk to to uh, to achieve. Um, you know, we're going to start back uh, tomorrow at uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one. Uh, but again, this is an even higher, uh, even higher level, an uh, even higher standard. You see what I'm saying? This is he's lifted the standard of God. God has lifted the expectation. Uh, Christ is not a lower standard. People continue to think that Christ is a lower standard when Christ is actually a higher standard, a higher expectation to live by. Right. Christ was before Moses, not after Moses. See what I'm saying? And that's what everybody fell in to realize. They think Christ was after Moses when he was really before Moses. This is a higher standard, a higher expectation, a higher level of uh, positivity, a higher level of loving your brothers like yourself, right? Uh, a higher level of, uh, you know, correction, a higher level of discipline, a higher level of wisdom, a higher level of thinking in, within your mind and walking in the spirit, right? And minding the things after the spirit. Right. A higher level of the righteousness of God. Right. Um, a spiritual tabernacle. That you cannot see. And we're going to get into faith, hope, love in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one tomorrow. Um, so hop on from seven to nine. Uh, shalom.